louder? <laughs> well, that's good. That's what I was supposed to do. Isn't it great to be in the house of the Lord, though? It's just, you know, there's so much going on out in the world. And to come into this place, into this sanctuary, and just feel the presence of the Lord. I, mean, I don't know about you, but um, I, I, I can't hardly wait, you know, to get here. I, I was praying over what message to give you folks uh, today, and I thought of all the times over the past few weeks that um, I allowed circumstances to kind of overwhelm me and to kind of dictate what kind of day I was going to have and what I was going to do for the Lord. So I thought about that, and then I, I came on this, and it's Philippians chapter 4. We're going to do verses 10 through 19 in our divinely inspired Bibles. And it's Paul talking about how to be content in any circumstance. In verse 10, Paul wrote, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia... No church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, according to your word and steadfast love, fill us all with the joy and satisfaction of contentment we have in Christ. Help us to learn to be content in any situation, just like the Apostle Paul. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. I don't know about you folks, but even as a child, I, I struggle with being content with my circumstances. And it, and it goes back years. I'm going to be 75 in November, and I'm going to take you back 68 years. That's how long it has been, right? I was about eight years old or so, and my best friend was given a brand new Swin bicycle. Now, I had to share a bicycle with my sister, so it was a girl's bicycle. She had won this in an art contest in a local newspaper. And can you imagine an eight-year-old boy riding a girl's bicycle? The humiliation involved in that. Was I picked on? Absolutely. Did I enjoy that? No. Anyway, my father came up with a solution. Now, we didn't have a lot of money, and he didn't have a lot of money, so he went to the local junkyard. He found a boy's bicycle and a girl's bicycle, because I had a younger sister who also didn't have a bicycle. And my dad brought those bicycles home. And he worked 12-hour days as a machinist, um, so he worked very hard, typically needed a nap by the time he got home, went to work at 4 o'clock in the morning. But every waking hour he had available to him, he spent sanding these bicycles down, removing the rust, painting them and repainting them to get just the right finish, um, redoing the handlebars, putting grips, hand grips on the handlebars and with the streamers. You guys remember those, right? That was, that was you were really profiling back then if you had streamers. <laughs> and he even replaced the seats uh, and covered them. And I don't know how he did all that, but my dad was very handy. Well, he called us out in the backyard one day, and he took these things out of our little shed, and he showed us our new bicycles. And I looked at it, and I, the only thought I had was, that ain't a new bicycle. That's an old bicycle. That's, that, that's nothing. And I stomped out. My mother uh, intercepted me, and, and mom was, was pretty good at the mom's guilt deal. So she laid that on me and to the point where I was almost in tears. And she said, you need to go back out there. You need to apologize to your father. 
and you need to thank him for all that he did for you. And it took me about two seconds to get back out to dad and, and do all that. And, you know, once I took the bicycle out for a spin, I rode that bicycle like it was the fastest vehicle known to mankind, even faster than Wanda on the turnpike. That's pretty fast. But the thing that always stuck with me and down through the years is the fact that I hurt my dad. How much I must have hurt him with the initial reaction to that wonderful gift of love that he gave me. Now take that to where we are today. And how often have we been given these wonderful gifts by our Heavenly Father? And how often have we looked at that as something less than what we wanted? How often have we just dissed it, if, as they say in the world today? And how much that must have hurt our Heavenly Father when we did. The fact is that true contentment comes only from being rightly related to God and trusting his sovereign, loving, purposeful providence. Sadly, too many of us seek it where it can't be found. We look for it in money or possessions or power or prestige or relationships or jobs and, yes, sometimes even ministries. And, of course, most of the time, freedom from difficulties. We think that, oh, if our life was just a little easier, how content we would be. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about contentment. For example, John the Baptist said to some soldiers who asked him how to show genuine repentance in Luke 3.14, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely, and here it is, and be content with your wages. They must have been grumbling about their pay. And so he, he hit them where it hurt. He said, be content with your wages, whatever they are. First Timothy, he wrote in verses 6 to 8, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. Those are needs. Those are the things that you really have to have met. So as you look at verse 10 again, and let's read through it, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. So what's Paul saying? Well, he's referring to the fact that it probably had been about 10 years since he planted the church in Philippi. But the cool thing was that even after he left uh, the Philippians, they had generously supported him in other Macedonian cities like Thessalonica and Berea. In fact, when he moved south even into Achaia, the Philippians continued their support as he ministered in Athens and Corinth. And the problem was that as the years passed, even though they had been concerned for his good, uh, something happened, and they weren't able to send that support anymore. We don't know why, and we don't know what happened. But at this point, Paul's in prison. By the way, he's writing a book of joy. That's what we call it, right, from prison. It gives you an idea of circumstances, not altering his perception on life. So he's writing from prison, and they had just sent a man by the name of Epaphroditus to visit, and he brought a gift to Paul. Now, it could have been some money or it could have been some food. We don't know what it was, but he brought this gift, and it was greatly appreciated. And, and then it caused Paul to rejoice greatly in the Lord. And I don't think it was just the fact that the gift met some need, but also because it gave evidence of their love for him, even after all these years. Occasionally, um, I was telling some of you, Wanda and I spent 12, 13 years in the wilderness known as Okeechobee. Um, anyway, it's a wilderness. Uh, but we were down there, and we started the Calvary Chapel, and um, we enjoyed our time there. We impacted a lot of lives. It was, it was great. It was, and by the way, the church was about this size, so this brings back memories. Anyway, we still go back occasionally to visit and to do what I'm doing today. I fill in for the pastor he works full-time, and um, he, his only day really of message preparation is Saturday. So anytime he can get a Sunday off, he's more than appreciative. But in going back there, and you know, we've been away for five or six years, I see people that had started with us. So you're talking about maybe 15, 16, 17 years. And every time I see them, there's an outpouring of love from them to me. And I experience a great joy in that. And I think that's what Paul felt as he received this gift. 
it was a joy that there was so much love still there. And here's the thing about Paul. There wasn't any panic on his part, no attempt to manipulate people, or no taking matters into his own hands. You see, Paul was content because he knew that the times and the seasons and opportunities of life are controlled by our sovereign God, who, according to Ephesians 1.11, works all things according to the counsel of his word. And in so doing, according to Romans 8.28, he causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. Now, how much is all? It's everything. All things. It doesn't say just all the good things. It's all things. So even if you're going through a trial this morning, even if you're going through a time of testing, if you're going through whatever, if somebody in your family is, eventually this is going to work out for your good, their good, and and whoever's, as long as they are the call according to his purpose. Uh, and, And I think that's important for us to understand. You know, sometimes people, they have to be in control of everything. Have you met people like that? They have to, every little thing down to the gnat's eyelash has to be controlled by them. How much contentment do you think they're going to experience in this life? It's not all. (laughs) It's none. You just can't have contentment if you want to be in control of every aspect of your life. Five years ago when Wanda was diagnosed with cancer, I knew the situation was totally out of my control, but I also knew that it was totally within God's. And as a result, Wanda and I committed that we would accept whatever his sovereign will was in this matter. We both immediately received a peace that passes all understanding. And and people would say, well, how do you you, you have a peace about that? I don't know. I can't explain it. We just had it. We just felt, you know what? This is going to work out. This is the Lord involved. And and, and so we were able to take that peace and use that to impact others around us. We even turned Wanda's eight-hour chemo sessions uh, into hours of joyful witnessing to those in the same circumstance as Wanda on either side. If you've ever been to one of these places where they do this chemo, it's just curtains, essentially, that separate you. And we would bring in our Christian music, and we would, you know, we would share readings from the Word. Um, and inevitably, people would tell us on either side as we were leaving, thank you so much, that really blessed me. Or, you know, uh, that was really neat to see that you guys were able to get through this. And the support that she has, and we're sure she's going to do all, all right. Now, it didn't just affect the people on either side. It affected the staff as well. And when Wanda rang that bell at the end of chemo, I mean... We were surrounded by staff. didn't hurt that we brought them pastries. But we were surrounded by staff, and um, my daughter and I did a little dance, and one that was just ringing that bell. But as we were listening to music, there was one album, and it was by Mercy Me. I don't know if you remember it, but it was called the Lifer album. Well, there's a song that Wanda just thought that this was her song, and, and the name of it was Even If. And yeah, I'm just going to read a few lyrics. Uh, They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing bad. I stood on this stage night after night, reminding the broken it'll be all right. But right now, oh, right now, I just can't. It's easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down. But what will I say when I'm held to the flame like I am right now? I know you're able, and I know you can. Save through the fire with your mighty hand. But even if you don't, my hope is in you alone. Wanda took those words to heart. Because we would go to church on Sundays, and she'd have that scarf covering her bald head. um, and, and, And women would inevitably come up to her who were struggling with cancer. And she had an opportunity to minister to them. And she impacted Quite a few people at Calvary Chapel Orlando, and as we traveled around, once she was able to, uh, other places as well. Well, two weeks ago, Wanda entered her fifth year of remission, and we continually thank God for that. And she's to the point now where she only has to see the oncologist once a year. And uh, we did celebrate, yes. 
But the thing I want you to see here is that even in the worst circumstances, if you turn it to the Lord, if you submit to him and his sovereignty, you will find contentment, no matter how it works out. A confident trust in God's providence is foundational to contentment. I want to read verse 11 again. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. That's an interesting statement. And it's interesting that uh, Paul didn't want the Philippians to misunderstand him. I think he was speaking from a position of need. So he adds this disclaimer. Hey, guys, I'm good. Thank you for your gift. You know, that's wonderful. I'm good. I, I've learned how to uh, get, come to terms with whatever the circumstance is. It didn't matter that he was a prisoner living in a small apartment with little to eat or drink and chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. In fact, as you read through Philippians, you realize that he was able to bring the gospel right into the emperor's palace because the prison guards were what was known as the Praetorian Guard, which is the emperor's guard. So they would come in and they'd be chained to Paul for six hours at a time or whatever it was, and uh, they weren't allowed to talk. So Paul had a captive audience. Now think of an evangelist like Paul chained to a guy for six hours. What do you think he did with that? I'm sure he started out with, you know, how you doing? <laughs> Listen, now let me tell you a story about a rabbi who, who um, was crucified, died, and was resurrected, and the power that's available to you even now. I could almost see Paul doing that. You see, his contentment was not affected by any physical situation. The thing is that true contentment comes only from God, and it enables us as believers to be satisfied and to be at ease in the midst of any problem that we may face. Sadly, people today, just as back then, aren't content with either little or much. In fact, it seems that those who are the wealthiest are often the most miserable and discontented. At one point in our stay in Okeechobee, Wanda worked for the Seminole tribe uh, out at the Brighton Reservation. And uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but Seminole Indians receive $10,000 a month each person for life. And if you're a parent, you receive $3,500 a month for each child, with the remainder going into a uh, trust fund for the child, which is theirs at age 18. So they have a lot of money. The highest uh, incidence of teenage pregnancy, uh, drug addiction, and suicide is in the reservation in Brighton. Yet they have all this. You say, how can that be? Because they're not finding contentment in that. And, and, and today, everything has become, for people, a need. As a result, men need better jobs. They need fancier cars. They need bigger homes. They need swimming pools. They need the latest computer, the latest technology. Women need careers outside the home, but ironically still need children. Young people need unending un sexual encounters. Children need the freedom to express express themselves outside the bondage of parental control. And even the church, sadly, has begun to build its ministry around people's felt needs. It shouldn't ought to be. The thing was that Paul knew that the true purpose of man was not to have his needs met. What was the true purpose? We sang it today. We're to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And because of that, he was satisfied with whatever God graciously granted him. As he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 8, having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. That'd be enough for him. Just, just as long as I can meet my basic needs, I am content. Listen, Christian, even when difficult, difficult times came, Paul remained content. Remember the incident in, uh, where he and uh, uh, I think it was Silas were, were beaten? with rods and chained up in a prison? I mean, what were they doing, moping? They were singing praises to the Lord. <laughs> they were content. And they brought down the house, literally, right? Listen, Christian, even when diff difficult times come to you, as long as you are rightly related to the Lord, you're going to find a contentment. And it's going to be a peace that passes all understanding. I used to tell folks that the Lord will meet all your needs, but not your greeds. 
the cool thing is that he knows your needs sometimes better than you do. How many times you come to the Lord and he didn't answer a specific prayer because of this need that you thought you had? Well, it's because the Lord looked at that need and said, no, that's not good for you. <laughs> you can't have that. It'd be bad for you. So you didn't get it. And people call that unanswered prayer. That was one of the best answered prayers I ever got. I can look back on my life and think of all the things I prayed for that I didn't get, and I find overwhelming joy in the fact that I didn't because I would have done some real damage in my walk. And the fact that uh, Paul does this leads us now to verse 12 where he says, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer. Paul repeats the phrase, I know how. Why does he do that? I believe it's because he's saying, based on my experience, as I've walked with the Lord, I have learned this. And based on where I am, spiritually speaking, I have learned this, that I can live no matter what my circumstances are in contentment. Paul's statement, I know how to be a base, well, that kind of tells us he knew how to, what it was to be poor. You know, he, he knew what it was to not know where his next meal was coming from. And, and he knew what it was to get by with just a few material items. On the other hand, he also knew how to live in prosperity, to be filled and to have an abundance. And when God graciously granted him more than he needed. The fact was that Paul wasn't one of those guys that preached about how a Christian uh, should live in poverty while being driven around in a limousine, dining at the best restaurants, wearing designer clothes, living at this huge house on a hill. I mean, his life wasn't exactly a testimonial for the prosperity gospel that we see today. And, and because it wasn't, he was truly a man of the people. When he talked, they listened. Kind of reminds me of the old E.F. Hutton commercial. You guys are old enough to remember that, most of you. When Hutton talks, they listen. Well, when Paul talked, they listened. His trials actually began right from the beginning at Damascus, um, shortly after his conversion, and it continued to be described throughout the book of Acts. Time doesn't permit us to go through all of those experiences this morning, but most of you already know about them. If you don't, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 33 kind of gives you a summary of what some of those trials were. But the important thing to see in all this is no matter what Paul's unique uh, and constant sufferings were, he had learned the secret of rising above them. In the midst of all his trials, he kept his focus on his Lord and Savior. Colossians 3, verses 1 and 2, we read, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, is sitting at the right, right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. And Paul's whole perspective really on life can best be summed up 2 Corinthians 4.17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of gold. Light affliction. I mean, 39, you know, times beaten. Uh, I, I can't imagine that. And, and, and just going hungry and, you know, essentially wearing rags at times, not having uh, any idea where he was going to lay his head um, at night. This was a, a light affliction. And it was because of the joy that he saw set before him, which was in service to the Lord. Pretty much like Christ, right? He went to the cross for you and me, for the joy that was set before him. We'll get to that in a minute. But it also, if you also look at verse 13, it says that he can do, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul is saying this. I don't care what struggles I'm involved in. I don't care what the enemy throws at me. I don't care what life throws at me. I can, I can handle it. I can do all things. I can deal with it. Why? Because I'm rightly related to my Lord and Savior. In Galatians 2.20, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The Greek word used here is Yeshua for I can do. What does that mean? It means to be strong. It means to have power. It means to have resources. 
And simply put, Paul was strong enough to endure anything through him who strengthened him. The apostle doesn't, of course, mean he could physically survive indefinitely without food or, or water or sleep or shelter, because we all require that. Those are needs, right? What he's saying is that when he reached the limit of his own resources and strength, even to the point of death, remember he was stoned to death and dragged outside the city. Even when he got to that point, he was supported by the strength of Christ. He was able to rise again. What did he do? Run away? No, he went back to the same city where he was stoned and continued to preach. That was the kind of strength that he, re strength that he received. It, it, it kind of reminds me of Isaiah 40, verses 29 to 31. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I have a very dear friend who lives in Port St. Lucie who has a uh, terrible back problem. I mean, uh, this woman's back is like every disc you can think of isn't functioning the way it should. So she's had to live a life of constant pain. As a result, there are days she can't even get out of bed. And when she does, she struggles to walk. In spite of that, the strength the Lord has given her has allowed her to build a global prayer ministry via the Internet. When she puts someone on her prayer list, it goes out all over the world. There's a, a fella in Jerusalem that's on her email list that will take a prayer request, jot it on a note, and bring it to the wall and slide it in. And I don't know if you folks are familiar with that, but a lot of people in Jerusalem believe that there's something special involved, whether there is or there isn't. It's that kind of ministry. Um, she has a prayer list. Uh, I saw her one day over her prayer list. It looked like a volume of war and peace. I mean, that thing was huge. She starts out first thing in the morning and doesn't really stop until sometime late in the afternoon. The thing I'm trying to say is that even on her most painful days, she feels like she's being lifted on the wings of eagles as she continues to serve the Lord. Any of you in service to the Lord, I don't care what it is, there are going to be days that you're going to feel that strength to do that job. There was a time when I was in Okeechobee where we had had a work day on a Saturday because I was such a visionary, knew that that wouldn't bother me. I have a herniated disc, and um, it about put me in traction. Problem was, I had to teach the next morning. And so I went into church, literally dragging myself in. Um, but my wife said, there's no way. And I said, I don't have a choice. I have to be there. Who's going who's gonna to teach? Anyway, I got behind the pulpit, and it was like all the pain went away. I preached a message, and, and then as soon as it was over and I stepped down, all the pain came back. <laughs> and I was literally on my back for the next several days. But the Lord allowed me and strengthened me enough to serve him in that capacity. And I, and I think that's true of all of us. You know, there is no quick fix. There's no shortcut to contentment. I, I, I can just tell you there just isn't. It comes only to those of us who are strengthened by divine power. And that divine power doesn't come from the government. It doesn't come from counselors. It doesn't come from therapy or self-help formulas. It doesn't come from medicines. It only comes from a consistent, godly relationship with the risen Lord. Amen? Well, let's finish up by looking at verses 14 to 19. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus, the thing sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. 
Now to our Father, our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, as you read through these verses, you should see that Paul's final message on contentment, no matter the circumstances, has to do with our concern for others. Listen, folks, people who live only for themselves will never be content because contentment for them can only come when their circumstances are exactly as they want them to be. How often does that happen? That's like a never. It just doesn't. I don't know about you all, but it's been my experience that that, that can't happen. Because our circumstances, I mean, we keep wanting more and more and more. That, that, that The fleshly nature that we have, right? If we're given this, then the expectation goes to this. If we're given that, then we, and it keeps moving up. So you never are content. Because all you're looking for is your needs. It's only those who unselfishly put others' well-being above their own that are going to find it. When you think about it, in this book of Philippians, we call, as I said earlier, the book of joy. It's been a consistent theme. Paul wrote this to the Philippians in uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 4. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Why, why did he encourage them to do that? Well, he further went in verse 5 to say, because that's the attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Again, think about it. If the Lord had looked out only for his own interests, why would he have ever left heaven to sacrifice himself for sinful, fallen people like us? Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy that was set before him. When Paul writes, nevertheless, it's about to change uh, he's about to change thoughts. He's going from one area to another. He knew he'd written uh, something in verse 10 to 13 that would easily send the wrong message to the Philippians. And, and what I'm saying is, you know, like, he didn't want them to think the gift wasn't appreciated that they had sent. Despite their poverty, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, they had sent a sacrificial gift to him through Africa. Epaphroditus. The thing was that after staying in Rome for a while and taking care of Paul, Paul sent Epaphroditus back to Philippi, which is how they got this letter, um, and he wanted them to understand, you know, he was doing okay, which is what he was trying to tell them in verses 11 to 13. But you could misunderstand that to be, we, you know, I was fine without your gift, and I'm fine now, don't worry about it. That's not what he was saying, though. There was a story I read and I'd like to share with you that kind of brings the point across I'm, I'm trying to give you. It was about three brothers who left home for college and later in life became very successful businessmen. Some years later, they were talking about their successes, more or less boasting about them, and they discussed the wonderful gifts that they had given their elderly mother who lived in another city. Milton, the first son, said, I had a big house built for mom. Marvin II said, well, I had an expensive theater put into that big house that you built for mom. And Melvin III's son said, you know how mom loves reading the Bible, but she can't anymore because she can't see very well? Well, I met this preacher. He told me about a parrot that could recite the entire Bible. It took 20 preachers 12 years to teach him. I had the pledge to contribute 100000 a year for 20 years to the church, but you know what? It was well worth it. Mom just has to name the chapter and verse, and the parrot will recite it. It's amazing. Well, the other brothers were quite impressed with that. A little time later, the mother sent out her thank you notes. She wrote, Milton, the house you built is so huge, I live in only one room, but I have to clean the whole house. Thanks anyway. Marvin, you gave me an expensive theater. It could hold 50 people. But all of my friends are dead. I've lost my hearing. I'm nearly blind. I'll never use it. Thanks for the gesture anyway. Dearest Melvin, you were the only son to have the good sense to give a little thought to your gift. That chicken was delicious. Thank you. <laughs> well, they said you couldn't see. Anyway, the point was, you know, she was telling him, well, yeah, this was thanks for the gift, but no thanks. Paul wasn't saying that. 
He appreciated the gift, but for other reasons. And to make sure the Philippians didn't misunderstand him, he wanted to quickly reassure them they had done well to share with him in his distress. And so he began by taking his readers back 10 years to his first preaching of the gospel in Philippi. And during that time, and even after he left Macedonia for the Achaean cities of Athens and Corinth, no other church was able to share with him concerning giving and receiving. And, and the phrase he uses is kind of business terminology. Uh, what I mean by that is that the word translated concerning is sometimes translated accounts. For example, in Matthew 18.23 and Luke 16.2. In the same way, the terms giving and receiving can mean credit and debit. So evidently, Paul was also a bookkeeper because he was keeping track of all the resources that they had given him. And this letter was more or less a, a receipt for those services that had been provided. Um, their generosity, along with Paul's own hard work, had allowed him to minister free of charge in Thessalonica, according to 1 Thessalonians 2.9. It says, For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil, for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. So he was getting a, some kind of a gift from the Philippians at that time, but he was also a tent maker. So he, he was literally there and not a burden financially to the people. He continued to say something similar in 2 Thessalonians 3, 8. Nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but worked with labor and toil night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. The thing was, Paul could rejoice over their gift, yet still be content in God's sovereign provision for him. Why? Because he was the opposite of selfish. He was selfless. That selflessness led him to write, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. That's the heart of a pastor. You know, the reason we try to get our sheep become fatter, to disciple you folks, to let you grow in the Lord, is because we want your accounts to be larger. We want the fruit to abound to you. It, it's not so much for anything that we need. And the principle that those who give generously will be blessed is, is really re repeated in Scripture uh, quite often. For example, Solomon wrote in Proverbs 11, 24 to 25, there is one who scatters, yet increases more. And there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. And in Proverbs uh, 1917, he said, He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. Luke 638, Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you. And then Paul himself, uh, who generously gave to the poor, uh, reminded the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 to 35, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now think about that. Now Paul isn't saying, you know, what some prosperity preachers might preach. Um, listen, you give, you know, a little love offering and the Lord's going to give you sevenfold back. That's not what this is about. What he's talking about is spiritual blessings and, and blessings that will be given them, uh, you know, even in eternity. But also, your needs will be met in this life because you can't outgive God. Anybody who thinks they can is, is fooling themselves. It's impossible. And using sacrificial language from the Old Testament, he described the Philippians' gift as a sweet-smelling aroma. Well, you find that in the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 to 21, and Exodus 29, 18, Leviticus 1, 9, Numbers 15, 3. And then there's an acceptable sacrifice mentioned in Leviticus 19.5 and 22.29, Isaiah 56.7, and well-pleasing to God, Psalm 51.19. You see, Paul saw the Philippians' gift as a sacrificial act of worship to God. And he viewed their gift as a spiritual sacrifice that, by the way, was required of New Testament believers because we no longer did the animal sacrifices. So he wrote also in 12, Romans 12.1, 12, 
present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable God, to God, which is your reasonable service. And then in the writer of Hebrews exhorts in Hebrews 13, 15 to 16, therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. And, and what we're, we're getting from all this is, listen, if you put others' needs above your own, if you're willing to give to them, if you're willing to support them, and it may be, you know, just answering a phone call, you know, at an inconvenient time. You know, you get a phone call, and you, all of us now on our phones can see who's calling, right? I have a son. I, I really don't like to answer the phone when he calls, but I do because I love him. Um, but you all have people like that in your life that maybe they call, and they call so often there are times it's just not convenient. You're doing something else. But as Christians... Your heart should be, you know, they may really need me. There may be an opportunity for ministry with this phone call. I need to answer it. I need to be available. And if you do that, and if you live your life like that, you know, you're never going to be in need. God will supply all your needs. And how does he do that? It says, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The New Testament repeatedly presents Christ Jesus as the source of all God's riches. For example, in Colossians 2, 3, it says, In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Ephesians 1, 3, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, verses 4 and 5, we read the grace of God which was given them in Christ Jesus, that in everything they were enriched in him. And lastly, Peter wrote in 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Let me leave you with this one thought. As I've already mentioned more than once, the book of Philippians is the book of joy. And I always wanted to say that out of that joy, we will find our contentment no matter what circumstance we face in our lives. So I'm going to give you an acronym. It's easy to remember. It's joy. Jesus, others, you. If you're able to live your life in accordance with those priorities, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in, you will find contentment for living today. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give all praise and glory to your most holy name. Help me today as I seek contentment in everything I do. No matter what journey I have to travel, I want to be contented, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, when I fall short, pick me up, lead me to the victory. I choose to walk with you always, and all God's people say, Amen. You can go. <laughs>